am the founder and CEO of Queen Mary, an award-winning edible brand in Ooh. Los Angeles. Um, yeah, so I got my start actually. Our producer's a little bit of a queen himself. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> I got my uh, start in cannabis actually as a delivery driver. I started back in 2016 delivering medical cannabis door to door, um, and you know I found that most of my clients I were delivering to were female. Uh, so I kind of got this idea that I wanted to start a delivery service for women. However, as we will get into it, the mm. licensing structure and everything that changed in California took place a little different. So I ended of pivoting and starting the brand Queen Mary, um, but it is a wellness brand designed for women and, you know, PTSD people, people looking at wellness, is, uh, the whole idea is it's a design to be a natural alternative to addictive prescriptions. So we have a morning, noon, and night regimen, starting with a daily tincture with coffee, THCV, and vitamin D, a maintenance gummy with rhodiola and B12, and a sleep aid gummy with linalool and CBN. It's all vegan, fast-acting, sugar-free, gluten-free, all the wonderful good stuff to make it healthy for you. You <laughs> did that out of scripts, too. Yeah. that screen right uh, okay we are back with another episode of media unshackled featuring the state of the states and giving a basic overview of the market structure and how things work within each of the art jurisdictions to be true downing again here with max you us from dope seo and we have brought to you the big state of california experts the big experts there's a lot of california people we could have picked from but we picked jared and tiana because they are awesome and they are here to give you a, an update, a preview, a little bit of history of how California works, what's happening over there. As we all know, the interstate jurisdiction by jurisdiction market exploration is difficult for anyone doing business development of any sort in cannabis. So this whole show is about giving people a little bit of a taste as to what is going on in that market, how the licensing structure works. But first, we want to talk about, about a little bit about each of you guys, just for a minute or two. Uh, your history in the cannabis industry, your companies, current events, current projects. Go ahead, Tiana. Yes, hi. My name Ladies is first. Tiana Woodruff. I am the founder and CEO of Queen Mary, an award-winning edible brand in Ooh. Los Angeles. Um, yeah, so I got my start actually Our producer's in a little bit of a queen himself. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> I got my uh, start in cannabis actually as a delivery driver. I started back in 2016 delivering medical cannabis door to door. Um, and, you know, I found that most of my clients I were delivering to were female. Uh, so I kind of got this idea that I wanted to start a delivery service for women. However, as we We'll get into it. The mm. licensing structure and everything that changed in California took place a little different. So I ended up pivoting and starting the brand Queen Mary. Um, but it is a wellness brand designed for women and, you know, PTSD people, people looking at wellness. Is, uh, the whole idea is it's a design to be a natural alternative to addictive prescriptions. So we have a morning, noon, and night regimen, starting with a daily tincture with coffee, THCV, and vitamin D, a maintenance gummy with rhodiola and B12, and a sleep aid gummy with linalool and CBN. It's all vegan, fast-acting, sugar-free, gluten-free, all the wonderful good stuff to make it healthy for you. You <laughs> did that without day. a script, too. Yeah, that was beautiful. Like, and, you, and you know, you. You're, you've been navigating the... Op we're going to talk about how you had to navigate the operational yes. regulatory structure of cannabis in California. We're going to get off that in a second, but first, let's get Jared introduced. And uh, he, the, the man with the second best hair in. Oh, nice. <laughs> I will so. take this. I will take the silver star for that. That's awesome. Okay. Um, Jared Kylo. Um, this is my 21st year in the cannabis space, mostly in California. Um, a retailer to start, um, cultivator throughout most of the space uh, as a retailer, just to try to vertically integrate as much as possible. Um, a, a lot of regulatory work. I got to sit on the medical marijuana task force under Gavin Newsom in San Francisco about 13 years ago. And we got to understand how government could actually support cannabis, best business practices, and standard operating procedures. Moved from San Francisco, took over a dispensary in Los Angeles called The Higher Path. Um, been there for 10 years and started a trade organization called the United Cannabis Business Association. I got most of the retailers together. We changed some of the laws in Los Angeles, got a ballot initiative, qualified, which I'll tell you, that cost a couple million dollars. Right. So to qualify something in Los Angeles, you know, you got to get 100,000 signatures and every Oof. signature is like $12 during like election campaigns. So we've as an organization of kind of like 
seen a lot of retailers through the pathway. And now, as an organization, we mostly work on state policy. Um, so we write tax bills and stuff. So last year, I think we ran four tax bills, something for consumption lounges, catering licenses. We did a tax reduction bill. So nowadays, my job is mostly lobbying and writing regulations and testifying in front of the Senate and the Assembly mm -hmm. and working with regulators. So that's uh, that's kind of what I've done for 20 years. Wow, you're big dog. Just me or are you a little intimidated? I'm, a little I, intimidated. I, I, I'm like the dumbest guy yeah, exactly. in the room right I now. Know, I'm like, what are you, I help people so well, weird. Like, you know. Help me, Lord, for I'm inadequate. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, good wow. God. It's another one that just makes me feel like yeah, a moron. Yeah, we look at MJ BizCon as the so courtroom. We're like the judge. The audience is like the jury. And we nice. now have you qualified as an expert. You have, you have a you, Yeah, you're <laughs> definitely qualified as an expert. Absolutely. Right, well, you, you know nuances that are beyond much of what we're going to get into in no this problem. show. We're going to start basically with like a little history. When did California go medicinal? <laughs> like, yeah. When do, it was, do we, let's go back to the beginning. I know there was plenty of cannabis prior to the first uh, medicinal initiative and in yeah we're back to prop 215 i think we're at 28 or 29 years ago yeah. when we first passed you know pretty much it was just for patients and you know the the industry bloomed quite a bit because there wasn't a lot of rules it was kind of just like a two page bill that said if you're a patient, you should be able to access cannabis. And a lot of it came from a lot of the people inside of San Francisco, you know, AIDS patients, cancer patients. It really was the pivotal point for, you know, patients to be able to get real access and not just, you know, a, a, a normal drugstore dealer. But then it expanded quite a bit. And you had like over 10,000 dispensaries in California pre Prop 64's passage. So there was quite a diversity in. in and yeah. what year did Prop 64 pass? Uh, it passed in 2016, but it, but it didn't get implemented until 2018. Okay, yeah. so if we go back to uh, the, all these dispensaries that were, give a little bit of people a little history. All these dispensaries opened up between 1999 and 2016. Yeah, there was quite a lot of demand. I mean, if you look in the city of Los Angeles, there was over 1,000 dispensaries. Um, they did kind of have some regulations there, but there was only about 180 of them that were legal under the laws that were there currently, but there wasn't a lot of enforcement. No one really knew how to enforce against patients and, and doctor's recommendations right. and who was growing for who. Right. So right. that gray area left a lot of room for like growth and that growth like really exploded quite quickly. And then most of it was the invisible hand of just, you know, just capitalism. Uh, good brands made it to stores and good <laughs> capitalism. I love that term. I'm a big good fan capitalism. Of the hand. <laughs> yeah, well, I gotta uh, say that it's San Francisco. I was there when the Giants won the World Series, and it was right after that. And they were like, "Oh, you've never been here? Welcome to San Francisco." And somebody passed me a joint. It was literally. It, I was just like, "I love this place." I've arrived. Yeah, I have arrived. <laughs> so, um, and I want to get a little bit talk about the history. Then we're going to talk about what it's like to actually operate within this framework. Uh, and you also operate as well. But we're getting sure. the history out of you. So, 2016, there was this transition into Prop 64. Yeah, Prop 64 was this push to say, let's get away from the fact that doctors are the only way to access cannabis. We knew that there was this kind of bifurcation of the industry. One was medical, one was recreational, and I don't think anyone really knew how much one overtook the other. So what the knew, difference was, right? I mean, There really wasn't back then. Right. Then it was like, you know, a doctor's note could be for anxiety or it could be for cancer. And right. So it, I think in a lot of regulators' eyes, they were like, let's stop pretending and let's start actually just doing something. And the pretending was, you know, we had like 50 different pot doctors that could, for $25, give you a recommendation. I'm remembering all this. <laughs> it, yeah. It undermined yeah. the, re, it undermined like the kind of the push that this is really medical because there were this kind of like, like these mills to just give out prescriptions. It so. was like a pseudo opioid thing when, like, when, when it was like, well, would you go to a pain clinic? It's like, oh, yeah, oh, you, you, you're hurt? You're hurt, of course. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take this and, and go with it. Yeah, there, there wasn't, there weren't any, like, real pre qualifying conditions or there was no research. Or there was no, like, let me educate you on anything. It was like, oh, you want weed? Cool, we'll just give you weed. Well, there, there were those some that, you know, you, you do come from that medical side and you were trying to provide for patients, especially in the city of San Francisco. Like, you were almost, <laughs> you had to provide for patients. Right. That was the expectation. And there was the other people who were coming in on the coattails of those expectations with, let's do this recreationally as much as we could. And so that expansion really kind of, I think, leaked into a lot of other cities. It really kind of pushed quickly. 
Um, and then you did get to see the forefront of patients getting that kind of access, and you did see more and more doctors giving recommendations. Yep. Whether they were good or bad, they were right. recommendations from a doctor to a patient, mm -hmm. and that meant something. And I think we've gotten a little bit away from that. Once Prop 64 passed, it was like, medical isn't necessary. Yep. And they didn't leave a lot of incentives inside the medical kind of access for people to continue to be medical patients. So once Prop 64 came through, they're like, I don't need a $40 barrier to entry to go to a pot doctor to get a recommendation if all I have to do is bring my driver's license. So the fact that we went from 100% of our sales being medical to where mostly where the industry now is, we're looking at about 5% of the overall revenue is generated from medical recommendations. So that has been the gap now that has been kind of a chasm that is now between medical and recreational, even though most people still self-identify as medically getting products, but they don't need that recommendation, so we've lost a little bit of data. And are there, uh, what the taxation difference between med for medical patients versus Ooh. adult use patients? Are, is there any? Only locally, at the state level, you're pretty much 15% excise tax on gross receipts. You still have to pay your standard sales tax, unless you're one of 2,100 people in California. 2,100 people out of 38 million got an MMIC card, which is a state kind of card that you go through your county health department and you bring them your doctor's recommendation. They charge you a bunch of money. They double check what supposedly your doctor gave you. Then they give you a card and that card now gives you the opportunity to not have to pay sales tax. So there is one incentive at the state level for those 2,100 people. But it's literally 2,000 people. That don't <laughs> how, how, how did that happen? I mean, who, who grandfathered that in? Who keep up with that legislation? Where did that MMIC thing come from? It was, it was part of Prop 64 exactly. in an effort to give patients uh, an opportunity to pay less. So it was that incentive program to say, you know, no prescription drugs are taxed with sales tax. So every time you go to the person, you go to the pharmacy, there's no sales tax on any prescription drug. So we were trying to follow that model um, as a state, but we kind of like pushed everyone into this weird corner where you give up some of your civil rights by being on a list for cannabis consumption. Like now, if you're a class A driver, you cannot cross yeah. state lines. You could lose your license. Whoa, um, really? Uh, you can't buy guns. You can't buy ammunition. So all of a sudden this became more, more or less. It was like, do you want to give up your civil rights to save nine and a half percent sales tax? And a lot of people said, I'm unwilling. And that, and that patient, technically is still paying higher taxes because they're paying the all the taxes are paid at the different levels of the supply chain in California, oh yeah it's, right you're, you're so, talking 45 to 50 percent oh. just taxation just to the consumer mm -hmm. yeah so and then that's still going to the patients because all they're only getting what is that noise it's the catering guy with the catering trays no it's an oh. it's the f1 cars around us so so let, let's get a little bit about the licensing structure as it exists post uh 64. How hard is it to get a state license? Is it happening at the local level? What's happening at the local level? What's it like to get a retail license, a manufacturing license, cultivation license in California? I know it's a big subject, but if oh, you just I touch on it a bit. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about what it's like to operate within that yeah. world. And yeah. Hey, I had to apply for a license too, so I know those options oh, are so going. You know this yeah, feel free. <laughs> the problem is, is we went with a dual licensing system. You have to get local approval and state approval. And because mm -hmm. of that, there's kind of like this, everyone wanted to kind of create their own rules because they wanted to collect their own taxes. So it became these little siloed versions of every municipality mm. saying, how are we going to make the most of this. Now, in the city of Los Angeles, they made the most of it by creating a 10% gross receipts tax, which is the highest in the state for all you know, retail sales. Now, to get a local license, it, I mean, some places it took two or three years because the system was being set up. A lot of people had to go to ballot initiatives inside their own city to get, because these are taxes now, so you got to get two thirds vote from the, from the con you know, from the constituents of the area. So every little city turned into their own little pocket. And then you had to go through city council, neighborhood councils to get a local license. Then you had to go through the state and CEQA and some other items there. So yep. we this have this- This is for retail manufacturing and cultivation. No, this, this is, is just retail. This is just retail. <laughs> yeah. retail. But manu manufacturing and stuff is still kind of in the same place, and so is and so is like uh, you know the cultivation side. I mean, now you have to do river and stream assessments. You have to do you know if you got it fish and wildlife. There are 17.
main government agencies that oversee cannabis licensing yep. throughout the supply and chain. And LA doesn't even okay. have a cultivation license anymore. Like that's not even an option when you go into the Los Angeles. They're like, like we're done. On their Cultiva website. You Cultivation you licenses Los are Angeles. not available so in the city of Los, in the county notes. of Los Angeles. So let's no. talk about your journey as somebody who actually said, I'm going to do Queen Mary. That was your first salvo into your plant touching ownership kind of business, right? Yeah. So, so you said, actually, I'm so in. Started. You looked around. You called Jared. Jared said, Yeah. Actually, what happened was with licensing things. So I thought I would, I literally didn't understand that you had to go through the city and through the state municipalities. So I was so green at the time as being just a delivery driver in the medical, uh, during the medical days. First off, when good for you 60, going for it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Boom. you. Yeah, no, seriously. Like you so, stepped up, you were like, I'm leveling up. I'm leveling up. So Huge. after Prop Here, 64 hit, like, June, like January 1st, when it went into effect in 2018, I went right to the DCC website. Like I applied for my license. I put in the application. I put the checklist and said, good. You know, so then they emailed me back like a week or two later and they're like, everything looks great. Um, however, where is your, you know, your business license to do business in your city? And I'm like, here, my business license. As I just applied for a regular, no, no. a business license. Uh, go keep talking. Okay. <laughs> I'm about to say, well, when you're done, well, I'm gonna say, I'll say what I'm going to say. You are the reason why Mita, well, by Dimitri Downing, Mita has no official position, is strongly against licensing caps. Because you took your skills and your knowledge and you did it. Yeah. Licensing caps obstruct hinder people from doing doing that. doing anything it was hard right. because that's what happened i went to it and then i went to the they're like there's got to be a, a cannabis office in your city and i was like okay so i researched and found out los angeles has the dcr and so i went to the dcr was like i applied at the state i need some sort of license with you and they're like yeah, no, we don't, we're not doing that yet. But we do have this program called Social Equity. You know, if you qualify, here's the criteria. So I read through it. It was like, all right. So I applied for Social Equity, um, got that status. It took about two months um, through their system. They only opened the window for like eight weeks. Yeah. Then they closed it. And then yeah. three weeks later is when they opened it up for um, licensing. Well, I this didn't This is retail manufacturing license. This is retail. Because okay. retail was like all anyone really wanted at the time. Right. It was like, we're going to do the first, you know, recreational stores in Los Angeles, one of the biggest municipalities in the country, right? So when I applied, um, they said the first hundred, li you know, they're giving out a hundred licenses, first come, first serve. Um, what happened was you had to have, the problem was you had to have your um, property attached to it already. You already had to have your space leased, you know, your location so they could approve it. So here I am, I'm like, all right, I got one month during this application window oh. to put stuff in. So I'm running around town trying to find and get a lease and everything, not knowing what's oh. going on in the back end, by the way, because I didn't know anybody. So oh. I'm like so excited, get this lease signed and like at the 11th hour, turn in my application before the window closes so happy that like I got my location I'm ready to go I'm doing this on my own and then well my whole world fell apart like everything yeah. came crashing down because I found out like right after that that I never stood a chance when they opened that that application service window they had over 250 applications in the first like 20 minutes of like the system was crashing like it was insane it ended up being long story short turning out that the city people sued the city in audit yeah. because people actually got into the system before the 10 a.m. opening and there was applications that went in before um, and like it was a, it was a mess and so like out the application numbers you know they're going first come first serve they're giving a hundred licenses in all of Los Angeles County. I'm number like 867. I didn't stand a chance. So good, I was just like, yeah, whatever, luck, you know, right? nothing. Yeah. And then we audited the city a little bit later. They ended up, the city decided to give another 100 licenses to, like, offset what they did. But the way they did that was they were going in line in order. So the, the way they, ordered, they did these 100 licenses was once you put your stuff in, they looked at we have a, like a law, like you have to be 700 feet from the dispensary. But you had no idea if the dispensary was in the, was leasing the place across the street right. because they weren't open yet. Right. So it was first come, first serve. Who put that application in first? And then so let's say I put one in, but someone put one in across the street, like two hours before me. They, they went. They got it, and I was knocked out of the whole race. No. Because with, I couldn't have knowing, not like even knowing. You were automatically so disqualified. So that's what they did with the next Ooh. hundred is they went back in line to those that were skipped, got first priority, and then the next hundred people, however... I still wasn't part of that, so I was like, I guess this, you know, hanging this thing up, I'm not doing it. And then I kind of came across, a, you know, I love the associations, I came across a nonprofit group called Our Academy, Our Dream. It was a 20-week cohort learning all about the cannabis industry, accounting, finance, attorneys, contracts. And then I learned that I 
did not need a license to start we a brand. Yeah. So I literally started Queen Mary as a brand. I like came with the idea, did the pro formulation of products, all of this during this 20-week cohort, and then I launched a brand on my own and then white labeled it. So what was the process for getting your brand properly licensed? What was that? So that license came later. So what happened is I actually operated my license for a year, my brand for almost two years, right. until I won a lottery license for social equity in the very last licensing round they did last December. So right now I'm in the process of opening my own dispensary after all of that. So it's really been a great thing. It's been, I've had a lot of hurdles though. I mean, I have lost two properties in, the, in this process, $40,000 with one in, in Westwood, another one um, in North Hollywood that pulled out on me. And here I am right now at the last minute, I have to like a hard to set, they gave one year so the people that won the first two years, some of them still don't have licenses, by right. the way. Those first 200, of those first 200, there's like 68 operational licenses, and the rest of them are just sitting there. Floaters, and, yeah. But this last round that they did to us, they gave us a, they gave us a deadline of one year. So mine expires December 8th, because that's when I won last year. Oh, so damn. I'm over here fighting a deadline, <laughs> trying to get this store open and get all the T's crossed and the dies, I's dotted. So it's been a process. It's been crazy. I mean, I've been, you know, through the shark, swam with the sharks, got, trying to get investors talking to VC capitalists. And the sad thing about social equity in Los Angeles is, you know, they only allow us to have one license. And we're learning that, you know, you need multiple stores to make money. A one-off store right. does not make money on its own very well. So let's just establish and you've been around for a while. And so they're forcing all of us, a lot of social equity applicants to partner with these bad contracts and these big, you know, chains because the chains right now in Los Angeles, if you're not social equity, they're not giving any retail licenses until 2025. So for five years, they locked in social equity only, but it's been such a mess. And then this year, don't get me started on what they started with the, um, the provisional licensing. So in Los Angeles and the state of California, every dispensary since they've done Prop 64 in 2018 has been operating on what we call a provisional license, which means it's not an annual. It is something that has to be renewed. It's a temporary license. Nobody had a solid license. So when the state decided in March like of this year, permit? yes, basically, <laughs> they decided they were like, we're, not, we're sundowning it. By March 31st, they actually had it in phases. There are no more. It has to go to annual. Well, the city of Los Angeles didn't even have a program for annual. So here wow. I am, just want a license. In the, in the middle of it being transferred from annual to provisional, and there's no application, so they're, I mean, it was, for lack of a better word, a shit show. And it's, I'm one of the wow. few of those hundred, there's probably going to be six licenses of the hundred awarded that are actually going to stand up. Jared, what does all this stuff make you think? Well, you know, I've been in Los Angeles for 10 years and dealing with the city council and even trying to write the measure. Measure M was something we passed yep. in Los Angeles, and we had 82% voter approval of this cannabis bill. And so we thought we were doing the right thing. We were establishing 180 existing previously issued licensed retailers to be priority and then everything else growth from there was going to be a social equity license but no one knew how to describe it you know, one knew how to define it. No one knew how to not violate Prop 19, which is like, you know, anti-discrimination laws. So if you just give licenses to someone of color, then you're actually, you're actually doing discrimination. So they don't allow that kind of commerce. So trying to tiptoe around the language and still provide licenses for people who were disenfranchised by the war on drugs has been a problem the whole country is falling into because we keep trying to find a way to give back to the you know, to those communities that didn't get any institutional wealth, but they went to jail for most of the most of the same things we're now licensed for. Right, and they probably know how to do it better than a lot of the people coming in. Oh, with, for sure. With, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I think the free market. Would, this is like a testament as to why we should have a free market. But that's a whole other issue. I'm not a fan of drug war 2.0 or prohibition no. 2.0. None of it makes sense. Civil no. criminal sanctions, all things nonsense. We, well, we don't need to get into that. But one of the things is we are constrained by time. So, our audience now knows that the Digo Day Association, lots of people like yourself, filled with knowledge, information, willing to share and help other people. Yeah, we're, we're mostly retailers. Two-thirds of our voting members have to have a retail license. That mm -hmm. way, we represent retail as a priority. It's not the mm -hmm. only license. Right. Almost every retailer has multiple licenses. So you come in and you learn a lot about, um, about how to run a business. You've got multiple owners there who have been running cannabis dispensaries in Los Angeles and throughout the state for 10, 15 years. So there's a lot of like experience to say, here's how we can help. Then you get resources like lawyers and accountants already know how to do 280E and know how to kind of... Uh, um, 
you know, kind of file your taxes for you. So a lot of ways of becoming a member of UCBA is really getting first information about regulatory changes and legislation, and then best business practices. And then you're also in a community where you can share information, share products. And if you produce something, being able to have another retailer sell it for you takes away the, the cost of trying to find everyone to buy yeah. your product. So it's just kind of a little network that we support each other. Awesome. Well, California That's is so a massive cool. adventure in and of itself. So I appreciate you being on our show yeah. so people know who you are, that you exist, and they can reach out to you for more guidance. And yourself as well. Are you available to be Absolutely. You know, I just did a talk guide. earlier, like yesterday. Um, I'm here to help as many the people of color and social equity. You know, I, I know the grit. I know the nitty-gritty, who to talk to, who to, who to avoid. So any questions, I'm always available. Please email me. You That's can reach me up. at Tiana at QueenMaryBrand.com. Um, you know, I'm free. I'm here to give advice and all and help and get in, just get in the trenches with you and, you know, fight for this for this plant that we need, you know, a, available to, to everybody. Well, I'm sorry we don't have time to get all the – I mean, there's so much to learn about California. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, right. I feel like we oh. could do three hours at least and yeah. just like not even get into it. That'd be part one. <laughs> the most important thing, though, is like if I know if I need something in California, I can call the two of you, and so can any member of our audience. So we appreciate Love you guys it. being on the show. Enjoy your MJ BizCon. Thank and you. Thank you, and good luck in California. And for Queen Mary, you have a brand that you're... Uh, the Higher Path and the Blueprint Group, which is a lobbying group. So those are the two that are probably, and UCBA is the trade organization. And, and, and he's, and his dispensary is amazing, by the way. He's, it's over on Ventura. It's in Sherman Oaks. He's not talking about Higher Path, but it's an amazing dispensary. <laughs> well, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a national you. industry. It's a global industry, and Queen Mary is a brand. We'll we're migrate brand, out of We're California. multi-state now. Yeah, we're California, Colorado, right. New Mexico. There you go. Um, nice. And, you know, as of last night, we might be in Canada. We met some great partners there, and, you know, an Oregon mix. So they, we're, we're expanding. That's so. awesome. So. Queen Mary, I own 100% of my brand, bootstrapping it every step of the way. Good <laughs> yeah, so. So yeah, we're, uh, Jared and I are going to start a brand called Eeyore Kush, and we're going to <laughs> push it across the globe. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's Love been it. another episode of Meet on Shackle. Thank you. Yeah, no. Thank you. Have a good one.